Hello and welcome to the Wisden Cricket Weekly podcast. England lose a test and they lose it in style, lasting just a fraction more than 80 overs across the two innings as South Africa's all-star attack ran riot at Lords. We'll talk about that test, the 100, a bit of bilateral white ball cricket. And for the first time on the show, hear it directly from Ben Stokes himself, who spoke to Joe earlier in the week uh, in the run-up to the release of Ben Stokes' Phoenix, Phoenix from the Ashes, which comes out on Amazon later this week. I'm Yaz Rana, and with me today is the magazine editor of Wisden Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon, the editor-in-chief of Wisden Cricket Monthly, Phil Walker, and the managing editor of Wisden.com, Ben Gardner. But first, let's go to Mark Butcher to hear his thoughts on South Africa's win at Lords. Mark, um, a heavy defeat for England at Lords, the first loss of the stokes McCullum era. England were blown away with the bat, barely batting for 80 overs across the whole Test match. South Africa were brilliant with the ball. England, not very good with the bat. Which of those two do you think was most significant in determining uh, the, the, the the result? Well, I mean, in a vacuum, you'd say it was, a, was South Africans bowling. Um, but as much as it's it's beguiling and enticing to sort of to draw a line under everything that has that has gone before and start solely with the Stokes McCullum era, of course, those sorts of batting performances, whether it's was eighty two point four overs, I think they managed across the two innings, were were kind of were um, not if not quite the norm, then they were extremely regular or far too regular under the previous regime. So um, if, if, yeah, in isolation, it's, it's South Africa's bowling in, in terms of a sort of like a, a the holistic view of, of English test match batting over stretching over a few years, then it's kind of something that you could see coming. Um, I happened to whisper to, to Ian Ward on the Friday morning, just before we went on air, that I had a funny feeling it might, it might be all done, um, you know, before the end of Friday. Um, and it turned out that that it was uh, it wasn't a bad shout. Um, look, I mean, th- th- we know that there was going to be. We, we've always known that playing in the way that they want to play is kind of is going to throw up occasions where this happened. Um, although I would argue actually that they they didn't really kind of go out and and try and blitz the ball all over the place. It neither in the first or the third innings of the match, which kind of throws up a rather more interesting or rather more subtle. Um, uh, diagnosis, which is that given conditions where it's absolutely imperative that you're able to show sort of decent defensive qualities and bat for a bit of time, um, we're no better at it now than we were before. Mm. Um, just on South Africa, this test match is being played with the backdrop of the, the new future tour programme being released and um, and that saying that for, for the next four years, South Africa are solely playing two test series. South Africa have had um, two two or three um, controversial, I guess, retirements in recent times. They've lost a lot of key players. For them to put a performance in like that at the start of a series with not that much cricket behind them, and then particularly that, that bowling attack, according to Cricket, that's the fastest ever bowling attack um, across a test match in England since th- those kind of records existed. Um, it was a stunning performance. And in Marco Janssen, they have this new superstar who batting at six, bowls from six for eight um, and, and was totally yeah. brilliant. And then Kagisa Rabada, I think he's got the, the, the lowest strike rate of any test match bowler who's got 250 test match wickets. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really, um, really impressive attack. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I think Athers... Um... Athers had the uh, the stats in his pocket before the before the first ball was bowled the Test match that he has the, the lowest strike rate of anybody since the nineteen hundred since the beginning of the nineteen hundreds, um, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, so he is a, he's just a wonderful bowler. He's so good to watch bowl. I mean, you know, you, you're almost surprised every time the ball comes out as quickly as it does because it's just so smooth. You know, it must must be like watching. I never had the Never had the, the the pleasure of watching Mikey bowl live, um, but you know it, it it has that similar sort of feel to it, whereby you know it's just poetic on the way to the crease. Even when he hits the crease, it's kind of it doesn't feel like it uh, it doesn't feel like it should be taking a great deal out of him, and this thing just comes fizzing out of the hand. Um, warning, kids, it does hurt. Um, fast bowling, very bad for the body. Uh, <laughs> So don't think that if Rabada suddenly drops five, six, seven miles per hour in pace, 
Um, it's because he's not trying. It's just because he makes it look easy, but it's really clearly isn't. Um, so look, the, the, uh, Nokia, we, we knew, we saw, he served notice of that um, when he made his debut against England back in um, 1920, that, that here was a bloke who just could tear in all day and bowl eye-wateringly quickly. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, running up and bumping the crap out of him again. I mean, they did it at Centurion back in the, back in the first test match of that series. Um, and he, and he stood up to it, no problem. And then came out and bowled the speed of light afterwards. Um, it does seem as though there's a few elephants memories knocking around, if not in the, uh, in the management, then at least from the guys on the field. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're very, very good. Um, and the thing that make the thing that makes them really, really potent is a batting lineup that kind of, um, that looks in terms of, um, in terms of the way they played anyway, in, in this test match that, that has the sort of basic tenets of being able to score as many runs as you need in the conditions that you're given. Um, and after all, that's really all batting's about. Can you score enough runs to give your bowling attack a chance to win your test matches? And they and they did that superbly at, at Lords. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody anybody realistically thought at the beginning of the game that 360 or whatever it was was going to be enough to win the test outright, but um, it proved it was plenty. Mm. Um, on, on Sky Commentary, you didn't hold back in your assessment of where you think Zach, whether you think Zach Crawley should be in the side for the second test or not. Um, since then, Brendan McCullum has come out in support of Crawley and there's one line that caught the eye in particular. And he said, I look at a guy like Zach and his skill set is not to be a consistent cricketer. What does that mean? Um, because if you're averaging in the 20s normally before McCullum reinvented test cricket, you occasionally still score fifties when you when you average twenty. That that's kind of how it works. That's how averages work. Well, or even hundreds, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so what what is McCullum saying, or is, is he is he trying to free up how Crawley plays? In that, is he trying to say that failures are okay? We want you to bat positively because I, you know, that that doesn't really make sense. He's essentially saying averaging eighteen is is fine. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know. I think we, we might have spoken about this. Oh, welcome back, by the way. Um, we might have spoken about this on, on, on last week's pod. And, you know, my, my, my deciphering of the, the support then was that, you know, you're trying, you're trying your very best to give the guy as much confidence, as much backing as you possibly can so that he can, you know, fulfil the potential that undoubtedly he has. This is slightly different. This is saying we're expecting you to fail a lot. Um, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> not entirely sure that that's that that's a great way to go about about picking your top order. But, um, look, it, it that that's it sounds ridiculous. And as much as I and I enjoy um, sort of Brendan and, and and Ben's sort of positivity and stuff, that's just that's just a bit of, bit of silliness. And like I said on on the TV. I'm not having a go at Zach here now because it, it's it's been patently obvious to me for for quite some time that every time the kid walks off the park now, having failed again, that the the light in the eyes grows a little bit dimmer and the body language becomes a little bit more um, sort of desperate. Um, and it felt like the final straw for me at Laws, which is why I, I, I said what I said in the way that I said it. Um, you know. I know as a, as a former player and somebody who's, whose life was um, and, and my entire sort of psyche, my entire mentality was built around whether or not I was successful in scoring runs, right? And that's one of the dangerous things about, about, about playing the game of cricket and why, and why people find themselves in the, in the lowest of the lows sometimes is because your self-worth is very much tied up in how successful you are in, in, putting, in scoring runs and hitting a little red ball around for periods of time which allow you to put runs on the ball right which sounds really really daft but it's it is daft you know the whole the whole sport's daft um and the more and more you fail the worse and worse that gets you know looking at yourself in the mirror in the morning becomes a bit of a bit of, or, of an ordeal everywhere he goes now with people that know anything about cricket they're going to be giving him stick he's getting abuse from club players he's getting abuse from people who can't lace his boots as a player um, he's getting abuse from people who really don't care too much, but kind of like f figure that it's fantastic. You know, it's just somebody else to have a pop at on online or whatever it might be. And that's that's no place for that's no place for for a young man who is literally just starting out his his international career to be. And there's no, and there is absolutely no reason for him to be in that position at all. 
you know, it, th there is, you know, noted, tick, huge promise, huge potential. Okay, brilliant. Go away, self sort it out, go and work out how to score runs on a regular basis, because let's face it, he hasn't even done, he hasn't done that in county cricket, let alone at international level. And when the time is right, you will come again. And you'll come again as a much, much better player. And you might add that um, that holy grail of consistency to the undoubted skill that you have as a, as a ball striker. And mm -hmm. I don't understand what's wrong with that. That's not conceding or, or admitting defeat or saying that your, your philosophy of the way to play is wrong. That's just going, this guy needs, needs something that he is unable to get in the spotlight of Test Match Cricket right now. We'll allow him to go and find it and then we will bring him back. And if you believe in him as much as you do, then there is no problem whatsoever in giving him that, giving him that break. I mean, you know, and at a more basic level, what does it say to, to all the lads out there in, in county cricket trying to, trying to churn out runs, trying to, trying to play aggressively and being, um, you know, managing to get their averages up around 40 or these top, top order players that are working unbelievably hard. It basically says to them, well, it doesn't actually matter what you do because where failure is now built in um, long-term failure extended failure is now built into the way that we select a side and that's that can't be right um like i said duty of care there's a duty of care in 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 all sorts of walks of life in the, the manner, manner in which you treat your employees and at the moment they're, they're doing him more harm than good by backing him i think mm. um you, you obviously had a, a really successful in career but you had you had a difficult start just on a human level what's it like struggling in in a in a position so public as the england test side with so many eyes on you and so many people very willing to give their opinion on you after um, yeah. it was in innings? It's, it's it's horrible actually i mean you know i i, I remember sort of going back so I, I played what i don't know i was i think i might have been dropped two or three times in the course of my first 25 26 27 test matches um and you know, I made a couple of hundreds and I made a lot of low scores, you know, didn't re I had no, no, no proper concept of how I was going to, uh, going to be sort of like have, have sort of real longevity up there. And every time I went back to the, to, to play for Surrey in between, you know, what the supporters of whatever, other, whatever club we were playing, it was particularly Glamorgan actually, this one always sticks out because they'd always sing songs about how much better Steve James was than me, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, that's, that's basically what you, that's basically what you get. Um, and as I said, you know, mentally that, that chips and eats away at you. Uh, and of course, you know, I went, went away and was very, very lucky to get back in the site. You know, no, nobody was saying, no one was saying about me after um, the South Africa series of away from home in 1999, um, 2000. Oh, well, you know, this is a bloke that we're going to be hanging our hat on for the rest of, for the next 10 years at the top of the order. You know, I didn't have that. That wasn't the case. I didn't have that sort of backing. Go away and work on your game, and, and you'll come back, and you'll be a, you know, you'll be the guy. I literally went away and didn't think I'd ever play again. But funnily enough, you were, you, you you work hard and make some changes, make some adjustments, and you and suddenly the chance presents itself, and you're better. You're a better player, and you cope with it better. Now, I think you know, twenty average, twenty four, twenty five the first time round in the similar amount of test matches, and average forty for the rest of my career batting at three so it's not it, you know it really isn't the end of the world to be left out and i and i'm and i'm slightly surprised that the um you know that, that management are sort of are putting him through this in order it almost seems like they're doing it in order to justify themselves rather than doing what's right for him mm -hmm. um so look you know i've said my piece it's I, there's, there's nothing going to change my mind that that says that continually pushing the guy out of the door um is is going to do him any favors long term what's going to do him favors long term is to is to actually is to go away have a really really good think about about the art of, of making runs work out a way to that that gives his undoubted ball striking ability a chance to show itself um i.e by doing the old-fashioned thing as well of of being good being playing the ball late knowing what to leave putting the bowlers on, you know, giving, giving the bowlers the, you know, the option to kind of come after him a little bit. Because at the moment, they don't even have to do anything. Um, they just have to sit in there and wait and he'll make a mistake. Make them have to chase you a little bit. And then eventually, you know, when was the last time you saw Zach Crawley play a pull shot? He's fantastic on the pull. They don't, but they don't, why are they ball short at him? There's no point. You just pitch it up and he'll nick it eventually. 
Mm. So you have to, you have to be able to you have to be able to play in a way that, that then forces the bowlers into into coming to your strengths a little bit. And at the moment, he can't do that. Mm. Um, and finally, a question away from the test match uh, on the hundred. You've worked on the hundred in in, the, in its first two years. Um, we're now almost halfway, maybe even more than halfway through its second season. Uh, are you getting tired of the the discourse around it? It's it's been it's been a long time since the competition uh, was first announced, and, and now it's been a while since the competition actually started. You you called someone out on on Twitter who called you out for 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 calling an over a set during a test match, something that's been been done since the beginning of time. Um, is is it becoming increasingly grating having to to deal with those types of comments? Look, I, I tell you what, I have an, I have an enormous amount of sympathy um, for the traditional cricket fan. Um, not only are they unable to, well, they are able to watch their counties, but but you know what I mean, um, during, during the 100. But let's not forget, you go right back to the very beginning of this and the horrendous marketing around this new competition, which basically said, we don't want you. Your, you know, your, your surplus to requirements. Um, this tournament is not for you. We're going to steal all your best players and you, you're just going to have to lump it. And that was, that was the basic marketing shout at the beginning. So if those were the messages that you were putting out, then you cannot be surprised, upset or angry when people react badly to that and continue to kind of um, be indignant about the entire shebang. Right, so that's so, so first and foremost, there's my position. However, it comes down to looking for every tiny little thing you possibly can to start yelling at, calling people out, um, giving people a hard time for things that are literally just, you know, just normal cricket terminology, normal things that happen on any given day. Um, in, in any game of cricket, whether it be club cricket. But I, mean, I, I think I said in the tweet that it, because, because I didn't want to, to speak for people that I didn't know, didn't know well enough, right? So I said in my tweet, uh, I think it was, I, I must have said something without even, without even considering it because it's just so, such a normal thing to say in, in, in the professional game. Terrific set of six from, from Jack Leach and then said whatever the score was. Um, and so then had to, and then stupidly I dived in, and I very rarely do this, but I, but I did on this occasion, thinking that all I had to do was just say, look, it's just something that there's something that we've been saying for years, for 30 years I've been in the pro game, long before the hundred came along, and some people took the exception to now using the, the the word the pro game. So lots of people coming back to me who weren't pro said they'd never heard of it before. I said, well. <laughs> that's probably because you weren't a pro right and then I had lots of people in the club game coming back to me saying we say that too you know in, in support of me and the whole thing became an absolute shit show people sort of like talking about how much they love the game and as a you know and and because they love it then I can't love it either because I've used a, a particular word in a particular term it's nonsense and people need to stop mm. um, there are there are there are many many good things about what the hundred is doing um, in terms of bringing in a new audience. All of those things that they said that it would do have, have, have turned out to be true so far. Has it, is it a panacea? Is it going to solve the, the game's issues going forward? Um, very much the jury is out on that, simply because it causes so many problems elsewhere for, for that, you know, we're talking about replacing Zach Crawley. Well, who do you replace him with? You know, no, no one's played a Red Bull game for goodness knows how long. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, you know, members being upset about the lack of cricket to go and watch in August. All of those things. All of those things stand. But come on, everybody, grow up a little bit. Um, the 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 chances are that things will change again because everybody accepts, even the most vociferous supporters of the hundred and everything that it stands for. Everybody accepts that there are there are issues. Um, and that they need to be sorted out for the for the good of the whole game, for the good of everything and everybody. Peace, man. Well, cheers for your time, Butch, and happy birthday for tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, 50. 50, jeez. <laughs> well, enjoy it. Thanks, man. <laughs> Joe, um, so much of the chat after each of England's five tests this summer, positively and negatively, has been about this new style of cricket 
But at the end of the day, but at the end of the day, this is a team with three guys averaging less than twenty-seven in the top seven. Results like this um, are just going to happen regardless of the brand of cricket with that personnel. That's absolutely the case, undeniable. Um, <laughs> and crucially, whatever brand of cricket you play, whatever your philosophy uh, with this England side, when Joe Root doesn't score runs, they lose, and that obviously happened uh, at Lords and against a really, really good South African attack, England can't be so reliant on him because he is going to get good balls and he is going to be dismissed. And I don't think Basball was in any way to blame, really, for, for what we saw at Lords. I thought England were poor. I mean, the Alex Lee shot really set the tone and they didn't get much better from there, really. Ollie Pope, the one shining light, the little brief spell of wickets before they let it go on day two. Uh, but there wasn't really much to to shout about there. The thing that kind of concerned me a little bit afterwards was when McCullum said, we need to look at it. I'm not sure we went hard enough because I don't know, watching that South African attack, I didn't feel like there were any loose deliveries that England could have seized upon. And there's a real difference between what we've seen with this South Africa attack and we've seen with India and New Zealand early this summer uh, against New Zealand. England went hard against Saudi. Uh, when Matt Henry came to the side, they went hard against him. Ajaz Patel won every bowl they went. but uh, And then even with India, Bumrah and uh, Shami were fantastic. But then the drop-off to Siraj and Thakur, who are both quite out of sorts, was dramatic. And England went hard at those guys and then got such momentum they could actually go against the, the kind of the premier bowlers as well. South Africa's attack doesn't really let you do that, particularly when Janssen and Ngidi, who are you know the, the weaker links in theory, are bowling as well as they did and don't have to bowl that many overs because they've got so many options. So... It, at this stage, it, it's looking like a, a hard series for England to win at this point. We know they can do it, but um, I certainly wouldn't be putting much money on them to bounce back and win 2-1 at this stage. Mm. It's interesting as well. Taha last week picked out like the pace of Stafford's bowlers as like, how England went against them as sort of the key defining factor, which looks like a good prediction based on the first test. But that also, in, in a couple of ways, that kind of nullifies being ultra-aggressive because firstly, it is just harder to assert yourself and to like you, you I think you can pick and choose less which balls you can hit when someone is bowling at 90 miles an hour but also it means that you will score quickly kind of regardless you don't need to be uh putting the tempo back onto South Africa because if you do stay in for any amount of time you will be scoring at a decent rate I mean Rabada has this brilliant strike rate that goes like three and a half runs and over through his career because they are so attacking so actually it's almost quite hard to put pressure back onto bowlers who are going to go for runs anyway and that's kind of already their game plan if you know what I mean mm. um, just on South Africa it's been a, an amazing turnaround for them when they lost against England at home two and a half years ago it felt like they were a really low ebb um, it's unlikely but it's possible that they go to number one in the world by the end of this year they're top of the world test championship already um, the South African journalist Dan Gallen tweeted that there's more than one way to be bold in test cricket and South Africa putting Jansen at six uh, when I think you guys on the show said last week it's probably a push for him to be a seven. Um, that paid off big time. Um, and that bowling attack is so good, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, New Zealand and India have good good attacks, but um, South Africa recently beat India in South Africa and no one really expected that. And th But with, with those four bowlers in Maharaj as well, who's a very, very serviceable left-arm spinner, they're going to challenge pretty much anyone in the world wherever. Yeah, bowling attacks win test matches uh, in the end. Uh, and so, and Joe's right. Suddenly, it's one hell of a mountain for England to, to climb, to claw their way back, back, back into this series. In the top 10 all-time strike rates in the history of the game, George Lohman, remember him? <laughs> He's top. Uh, and then across the next nine spaces, three of them are populated by South African players, bowlers who played this week at Lords or last week at Lords. So that's the level that they're working at. And the fact that it's a strike rate table as well is telling because that notion of South Africa playing grizzled, attritional cricket, sitting in, bowling dry, is not borne out by the stats. They have some champion seamers and they utilise them brilliantly. And it was very striking watching it on day, on day one, in, but in particular on day three, how England didn't really have anywhere to go because they were just relentlessly coming at you. There was that brief period where Norkia, who's unreasonably fast, 
and terrifyingly fast. Lost his way briefly, and Bairstow played a few shots. And I think he took him for you know, 15 or 20 off his first couple of overs. But after that, that was the only period in the game across 83 overs, by the way. England batted for 83 overs across the whole of the game. Uh, you've got to go well back into the annals, right, Ben, apparently, to find, to find a, an equivalent. So it's England's shortest home defeat in terms of the total length of the Test match since uh, the 1800s. Right. And uh, the fewest balls they faced in a home defeat since 95. So Yeah, the, the Edgbaston death, death trap, trap uh, yeah, against West Indies. Indies. Yeah, so, so that's the context. But only for that 20 minutes, even less than that, when Norkia was finding his radar on day three, did England look like they had any respite against an astonishingly varied and high-level attack, which we did know about. But one thing you can't legislate for is is how a player rocks up at Lords and performs first up. And Giedi, fresh to that situation. Janssen, again, fresh. That Janssen spell on the first morning when he got rid of Root, and it was a, you know, a kind of... A, a bail clipper on on on, on the le, on the top of the, the leg stump. That said, a brutal brutal break back from left arm round, and there was no way out for England at any point. This notion, whatever you want to call it, um, something ball. I forget what the term is. That was irrelevant. I thought for most of the game, really, <laughs> and that's why I was surprised to hear McCullum bring it up as, as the kind of identifying factor of the defeat was that they hadn't gone hard enough because that that just wasn't how I read it at all. Yeah. I, just, I, I it, think that would be a bit of positive kidology in his own dressing sure, room. Sure, sure. D- don't go into your shell. Because you've been outgunned, don't go into your shell. Yeah. Still believe it in the way. Yeah. I, I suppose. Um, j- just just briefly, uh, Rabada is a champion. We know that. But I was just saying it before the show. You look for these little kernels of optimism in what's a very uh, muddy and knotty and concerning modern landscape with South Africa's test future being squeezed ever more, as we know. And that was the subtext across the whole of that game and will be rightly across the next few weeks as well. It's worrying, to say the least. But And so in that context, you look for these little moments and Rabada walking off, beaming, and then doing the the honours board square with his fingers to the dressing room and then the little squiggle, get my name up there, was a throwback to the real fundaments of the game and a reminder that for all the money that swells around, for all the power that players have and for all that priorities are shifting individually and collectively, and we should all be very mindful and nervous about that, I think. And yet, in the end, there's a there's a sort of atavistic beauty to it. You still can't get any better than that. And you saw the way Nokia reacted at the end. He was a kid. He was just a bounding kid. Didn't know what to do with himself afterwards. Uh, and in all the interviews he gave, he was lovingly naive and childlike. And that was my abiding memory of what was of, of the game. I was there for the the vast majority of it, and was really taken with their story because it's given extra poignancy I suppose because of the landscape that 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 we're faced with Uh, yeah it's interesting because I wouldn't have said usually I'm I'm not I don't get hugely patriotic about cricket but I do want England to win I think probably more than you do most of the time to be fair Phil I think more than Phil says he does I said said, said, (laughs) Spurs to win more than England yeah probably England to win more than you yeah (laughs) but and I, but there's not been too many times where I've wanted South Africa to beat England. And I'm not saying I want them to beat England, but I would not begrudge them in the slightest this summer. There is something about the kind of the context, the environment, as you're describing, the the relatively few opportunities South Africa get. Uh, and also just the, the you know, the likability of, of mm. their side, actually, mm. as well, that um, I'd, I'd, I'd be perfectly happy with that. The one thing is I'd like England to put up a bit more of a fight because this, this could be a... Re- uh, this this was a really entertaining match, but it, it wasn't a, a good match in the sense of a, of a close match, clearly. And I was really looking forward to this series because I thought it would be tight and it'd be a real shame if England keep doing this and actually don't kind of don't give up a, give up enough of a fight as they should against what's clearly a very uh, good side. For what it's worth, I'm sticking to my prediction that it will be one one going into the Oval as I wrote in the magazine, and then all to play for on a result pitch at the Oval as it has been all year. I'm still leaning that way, perhaps more in hope than expectation. 
Uh, it could easily, as you also wrote, Joe, you know, in the magazine, it could be, it could be a steamroller either side. It's, momentum in a three-match series is quite key. England do have form in flipping bad performances on their head. They do have form, and they are obviously mercurial anyway because of the, the extremes of the, the way that they want to play, at least. But again, just on that point, just briefly, what struck me on day two was how military and pedestrian the attack is and how, in some ways, it's a bit of a, um, it's a conflict with the philosophy. Uh, it's very hard to play expansive, breakout, expressionless, express, expressive, rather, cricket when all your bowlers bowl from a similar height, right arm over, uh, in a very, very similar MPH bracket. And you have a left arm spinner who I thought actually bowled really well, Leach, probably the best I've seen him bowl at Lords anyway. Uh, and he stemmed the flow a little bit uh, on day two. But still, there was a, uh, you know, a predictability to that attack. And it's very hard to know where to go for all folks' his funkiness with his fields. And again, always interesting to watch him in the field. After that, you are hamstrung. You are hamstrung by a lack of pace and a lack of variety. Well, Stokes is where you go to, and we can't keep going to that well because... He fell over three times, yeah. Stokes. He clearly was, was in pain, yeah. wincing throughout. And you're, you're right, he was their only point of difference. And mm. you don't want that situation. I think you make a valid point about the South African batting lineup. It's, it's very, very inexperienced. And was it, it were it not for that uh, Elgar Erwe opening stand in the second innings, it could have been a very different test match. Um, also, you know... The, the toss important. Mm. Dream like uh, Lord's first day, bowl first conditions. England's result, England's collapse was exacerbated by some pretty injudicious shots, as Joe says, you know, with Alex Lee setting the tone with a sort of flat footed and rather absent minded waft. And then it went from there. But even so, big toss to win that one for South Africa. Mm. Um, ben, with the, with the context of what's going on with South and Test cricket, in that Basically, they're not going to play three Test series anymore. Um, is there is there almost a sadness to seeing them do so well? And with a player like Marco Janssen, who's twenty one years old, twenty two years old, doing so well so early in his Test career. I mean, we're talking about it before we start recording. South Africa got a pretty good case to be the most consistent Test side of the twenty first century. You definitely associate South Africa doing really well whenever they've come here, with the exception of twenty seventeen a, a little bit. They've won in Australia a few times this century more than anyone else has. Um, it's almost sad seeing a team that could be the number one side in the world according to the rankings and according to the World Test Championship table, um, knowing that they're doing so well at the moment, possibly not playing that much Test cricket in the next four years. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's massively sad. And I mean, just to, to line out how stark this is in the, the new Future Talks programme, um, that every... So Neil Manthorpe wrote a very good column, which is in the new magazine, also on wisdom.com. Um, and he points out that every series of four or more matches in the new Future Talks programme is between two of the big three test sides and every series of three or more matches involves at least one of the big three test sides so outside of the big three there are two match or series or one of test matches which is yeah which is obviously i mean two test series are pretty rubbish in my opinion i mean you know you get the, the odd good game but they almost always feel uh unsatisfactory in some way um and as you say yeah, this is a staff team that is brimming with potential Matt Manthorpe wrote in that piece that he felt this was possibly the most important series Africa have maybe ever played. And with the implication that uh, a statement result could show that they demand more time and uh, more sort of uh, more, more, more games and time than schedule from the, from the big three. But I, I think that, that I hope so, but I think that's kind of optimistic. I kind of think that economics will just end up winning out and that South Africa will just play very few three test series from here on out. And then when they do get to play them, when the next one is what in at least five years' time, because if that's how the schedule is, is allowed it, um, they will be a, a weaker test team by that point because they'll have had so much less game time than the rest of the teams. And mm. what, one thing I was, I was discussing it with, with Taha, I think, um, and I think it's a it's a shame. I think that the, the four day test movement uh, or proposition didn't gain any significant momentum because I one I think if there was a real sort of popular swell behind it, uh, then when the first World Test Championship was launched or when the second schedule was being decided, uh, it would have been possible for that to be a concession that you say, we have a minimum of three Test Series and World Test Championship, but they can be four-day tests because you're, you're scheduling 12 days of cricket rather than 
10 days and we know that lots of tests as this one did finish within that time limit anyway and that to me would be a much much preferable state of affairs than what we have at the moment when three test series outside of the big three nations basically don't exist anymore it feels like that the dynamic around that four-day test conversation has changed quite a bit because when it was first brought up it seemed like a kind of heinous suggestion to those who have followed test cricket for such a long time now it's actually starting to feel more like a solution that might help test cricket survive and i, I do sort of detect that shift among well, Mark Taylor you brought up the other day Mark mm. Taylor did I mention that on the show yeah right you know uh brilliant Australian captain his reputation is built on test cricket saying four day test cricket might might way, well be the way to go to to keep this thing and going has, and has held that position for years as well for a number of years right. hmm. um but it's also a fair bit about Crawley are there any changes you guys make to the England team uh Maybe not immediately, but Ben Folks didn't exude a whole lot of confidence against the pace of Norkia in particular. Harry Brook is still waiting on the outside, one of the form players in the country, 100 of the most recent Red Bull game. Phil, you've made a noise. Yeah, I mean, I'll go first. Ben Folks is not a great player of, of ultra quick bowling, and, and the stats bear that out. Uh, and by reputation, he's, he's, he's known to, to not be an outstanding player against the quicks, the real quicks. Uh, and the two shots that he played were indicative of that. You know, it's the age-old cliche that you do weird things in the face of extreme pace. And, and he did play two shots that he wouldn't like to revisit. Just on that, I thought Michael Atherton did a really good explanation of what it's like facing really, really fast bowling. He said you basically get to a certain point, he said about 88 miles per hour, where you just can't actually track the ball anymore. So even against 85 miles per hour bowlers, he said you can actually track the ball to the bat. And he said there's an element of guessing where the ball's going at a certain pace. And some players are going to have a natural ability against that. Some players aren't. And Norkia is so fast, mm. bowling at 94, 95 miles per hour. That is just a different game to anything you can really prepare against in a county game in particular. Yeah, indeed. And it remains the, the ongoing mystery, doesn't it? That eludes, obviously, the four goons sitting around a table here. It, it, it's... It's it's a level of sporting. It, it, it's inexplicable how they do it, and studies have been made. And I remember Atherton was actually a part of one of these studies that was made years and years ago, and uh, various clever people from universities concluded that you literally can't see the ball, so you are reacting to certain clues and ticks and and giveaways in the hand, the position of the hand in the run up, and you are looking at a vague area hoping that the ball will emerge at some point as this blur and then the muscle memory is meant to kick in but so much of it is down is is an anticipatory thing mm. rather than being able to track it from the hand and then react accordingly i mean it's it's mind blowing really is um ask your question uh if 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 they have the folks conversation then they have to have the bearstow conversation don't they and do they dare when Bairstow is finally at ease in his position in that team, you can imagine the lorry load of shit that will come down on their heads if they say, all right, Johnny, you know what's going to happen, mate. You've seen it coming back at six or seven and here are the gloves. Remember how to catch? I don't know. You can't, you can't put him down at seven. Well, I, I suppose you one can't. workaround would be, unless you think the workload would be too high. Well, would keep him at five and give him the gloves. Well, yeah, and, and and put Stokes at seven. I mean, Stokes is effectively batting like a number seven at the moment. I mean, his, his returns are, are better than people, I think, assume that something is still averaging just under 40. But he, he isn't batting with someone who's going to have any sort of permanence. He is coming out looking to change momentum of the game. That suits the role of number seven more than it does someone in the in the top six. And that's just one position. But And then you bring in Harry Brook at number six, possibly. I mean, it might be that that's getting a bit too funky and that it is the actual having of the gloves that... Is the burden? I don't know. It's a very interesting solution to, to this question, which I don't think is a question they'll be considering yet, by the way. You know, it's folks' his time. He's done okay since he's coming to the side. His keeping's not been foolproof, but then no one's is ever in history. Alan not drop catches. Uh, they're not ready yet to begin having that conversation. That said, um, if we are having it, then that is a good theory. But then, of course, you lose the, the, the magic of Stokes at, at six, where that five and a half, six position that he's been in for the last three or four years. And he's obviously been, you know, uh, superb in that, in that position overall. That would be what you'd lose. Uh, but, but, yeah. it, but, but it makes sense, right? 
Yeah, it does make some sense. I think it'd be a shame because I think Stokes would continue to play the w- in the way that he is and I don't want him to play like that. I want him to play like a proper batter. You're kind of giving him more license <laughs> when he's taking about all the license he could anyway. Uh, look, I'm really keen to get Harry Brook in, but I think you stick as you are for the time being. I saw Alistair Cook suggesting Harry Brook open in place of Crawley. I know we're not allowed to mention Crawley, but it's difficult when mm. we're mentioning uh, <laughs> the team selection. That's an option. Doesn't feel like a particularly great option or one Cook th- acknowledges that himself I think yeah, he says he, if, he if you do drop Crawley I guess you'd have to go Brook he does. I mean yeah. if I was if we're looking for an opener I'd, I'd still go back to Rory Burns and I'm sure there'll be groans <laughs> from people listening to this podcast but he's he's got 100 against a very good Australian pace attack in these conditions uh, I think he averages 34 in England which you know is not well beating but it's pretty good as English openers goes these days it's another part of the thing that frustrates me with so the Crawley conversation is this idea that um, the way that McCullum is talking is though there is no one else out there and I think that's a problem for who you bring in it's one thing about giving the player in the side confidence but if, we're, if he's saying well he won't be consistent he's not that good well what does it say that he thinks about the guys on the outside looking in and I, th- I think that's not a great place to start with some of these guys mm. and I still think you know Burns is a serviceable enough opener uh, particularly given the demands of this South African attack mm. Can I say one thing on folks quickly uh, so just, uh, I acknowledge what you say about the ultra pacing. I think it's absolutely accurate. I'd say that you're going to, you're unlikely to find many wicketkeeper batters a, a, around the world, really, who are going to be, have, who aren't going to have a, a chink in their armour somewhere, are going to have a weakness. I realise it's more pronounced, but also given the number of bowlers who are at the speed of Norkia in the world, mm-hmm. it's not the worst one to have. I guess mm-hmm. I'd also say that, I mean, as you rightly say, he won't have faced that much of it in county cricket and therefore in his career there's the possibility that he gets better at it as well as he faces more sure. of it. Um, and also, I mean, you know, this is, you, you could argue that is he ever going to get a long innings considering how vulnerable he looked? But these were both early dismissals as well as they were sort of technically culpable ones. It, and, you know, you do get your iron, don't you? So it might be that after he faces 30 balls and then he is able yeah, to play them a little bit better possibly. And then also when you look at the summer, his average is, is really bad. He's averaging 20, 20, 22.6 for the summer, I think. But then when you actually break it down, the first test of the summer, he played actually a very good knock. And I think at the time you'd have said that was worth more than the 30 odd it was. And so when you look at that average, you probably take it up a few notches in your mind because of that. The second test, he makes a, a half century as England are trying to match that 500 and then seals the chase. And then he makes, I think, a duck in the test when he has COVID, uh, misses the game. And then this has been his first full poor test match. So although the average is bad, when you break it down like that, it's... Before this test, I don't think people would have had that many concerns about him. And I appreciate why the concerns are there. I'm not saying, you know, not fully defending folks at all. But I also wouldn't write him off either. Even if that pace weakness doesn't get resolved, I think that you can be uh, a useful number seven in a test side, even if you have a vulnerability, I suppose. Yeah, it doesn't feel that long ago that we were sitting around this table talking about Ben Folks looking really impressive at that num- in that number seven mm. role. So I think... Be wary of flip-flopping. Stick with him for now. I think we've done well not to mention Josh Butler's name there. Um, anything you change the bowling attack? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd bring in Ollie Robinson for Stuart Broad and I'd, I think I'd have done it for the, the first as well. Uh, it, essentially because at this point in time, Ollie Robinson is a better test bowler than Stuart Broad, or at least from the look of how he bowled in that uh, that warm-up game, went on a flat pitch. He caused Africa real problems in that second innings. Uh, and just going back to last year when Robinson was brilliant for the year, I know Broad missed some of your injury, but Robinson just, he was ahead of Broad in the pecking order at that, uh, at that point and now has been struggling with fitness and injury and has now slipped behind him again. And the, I, the question I can't work out is, is why exactly. If England have what issues, have concerns about his fitness, his ability to get through a test match, then he shouldn't be in the squad, I think, because, you, because he might have to play, you know, you, someone rolls an ankle. Robinson will be the next guy they call to come in. So I think Robinson is, I think, a better bowler than Stuart Broad right now, and therefore he should play. I mean, he doesn't you know, solve the problem of the, the high pace and everything, but I think that uh, he will cause South Africa problems. No, they, will, they will be worried, England, because they were comprehensively out bowled, and not just through the air in terms of pace, but uh, they were very innocuous for the first couple of hours against South Africa's openers. I think there was one half chance where Elgar nicked one through third slip gully but aside from that it was very manageable uh 
Potts was eager, bowled some good balls, but was also quite ineffective, ineffective in, in many cases uh, and went for a few. I think he was like 10 overs for 50-odd at one point. Broad was innocuous as well with the new ball. Anderson was Anderson, of course. Uh, but they didn't really have that anywhere to go quite quickly and it was quite evident, I thought. And, and what the impression I got of, of what Stuart Broad did was instinctively reverted back to the previous iteration of Stuart Broad when his figures seemed to be running away from him, from him a little bit he pulled his length back and he and he and he went safe it felt to me anyway that's and, that's what um philander on tms was saying as well he was quite critical of right okay he's very he's very very measured but he was he clearly didn't think that anderson really? broad okay. bowled, bowled very well they're both a bit defensive playing it a bit safe which it, is it felt like that to me yeah. broad was hit down the ground early on by elgar punched him through mid on and then another one on his pads and he hit him through mid wicket so those two over-pitched deliveries. And you can kind of understand where Broad's coming from because it looks floaty. Uh, and so then he pulls it back, but then you lose the, the impact of the new ball. And when you're defending 160... But that's also a reason to be more cautious as well, isn't it? You can go, sure, it can go it's, both it's ways. the balance. Yeah. It is, you're right, of course it is. It's the balance. But I felt like they, they neglected that, that chance um, and that Broad decided... Maybe even subconsciously, just just hang back, and suddenly they're fifty for naught, and then the game is inching away from you. Mm. Um, Joe, you spoke to Ben Stokes last week. What was that like? It was good. Yeah, it was. A, it's one of those kind of um, sort of press junket things. So you get a very clearly marked ten minutes, and you can only ask him about the film. Um, so you know, it it was more one dimensional than it would be if I was just going to ask him about anything I liked. But he was he was good. Um, it, the film's good. The film is is enjoyable. Um, I guess as as pure cricket fans, if you're listening to this podcast, you, you probably are. There's quite a lot of stuff that you'll you'll know that they obviously have to feed the the wider Amazon audience. But there is some genuine insight in there, and and in particular the the interviews he's doing with Sam Mendes, which are just two weeks after the panic attack that he has in in Nottingham. It's interesting that he's still kind of living that whilst he's being interviewed. And to be honest, he looks like he does not want to be there at all. And I kind of addressed that in the interview. Uh, it must have been a really tough thing to go through um even aside from the difficulties of the experiences mm. to then have to kind of face up to the cameras and be interviewed by a hollywood film director uh and then the scenes in new zealand are really moving when he's when he's out with his dad um shortly before he dies as he's kind of dealing with this illness this you know incredibly strong man who is you know is fading fast and and seeing his son go out there it's, it's, it's really moving stuff and again i was like that that would be a difficult thing to have a camera in the background while you're while you're going through this and mm. i thought um yeah i thought stokes addressed those questions pretty well when i put them to him mm. um well here is joe's chat with ben stokes um so ben with documentaries of this kind you generally have the subjects of the film reflecting on an experience after the event but this film's a bit different in that sam mendes is interviewing you when you're really still at a low point just a fortnight after you've had that panic attack and reached out for help how difficult was it to be interviewed at that point and kind of to explain what you were going through when you were still clearly right in the heart of it? Um, no, honestly, not at all. Um, you know, I, I wanted it to be in there, um, you know, so it was very important that sort of we and I sort of said I wanted to do it. Um, take you back to the before we even started filming, like one thing that I said I really wanted to do if we were to do this was to make sure that this whole thing was authentic and it was me and it wasn't a um PR stunt to, to make me look good if that makes sense you know like been through you know loads on the field off the field that um you know I don't want it to just be good 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 you know because it's been a lot of bad as well and I think if we didn't include stuff like that people who watched it would be like why is that not in there like why is it all just good stuff because um you know I've seen it as an opportunity to actually put myself across as actually me not what maybe people think I am because what they see in the field and what they see in, you know, press conferences or whatever it is, you know, like just wanted to be authentic. And, you know, Sam and the Whisper team, I think were very happy when I was of that opinion that I wanted it to make sure that this is completely me and it's not like scripted or can you do this? Can you be like that here? Because I don't think I would have enjoyed it. I don't think the product would have been as good. So everything in the documentary is is me in its purest form. 
throughout your career, you've never given the impression of someone who uh, is especially motivated by the idea of fame or celebrity or seem to find it especially appealing. I wondered if you had any reservations about opening your life up to the public through this film and, and, and potentially reaching a new audience outside of cricket that wouldn't necessarily have followed your life otherwise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I think what the when I watched this back for the first time, I've only watched the first cut, by the way. I haven't managed not lucky enough like you to be able to see the, the final version because I wanted it to be a surprise for me as well when I watched it for the premiere. But what this, I feel watching it, for me was it was as great as it was it was also a very strange and surreal thing to watch something completely about me but watching it of someone who I didn't know it's really hard to explain because even though I knew what was in there I knew what was going to be coming up I knew the situations and I knew the scenarios that were on screen in front of me I was watching it like geez I don't know what's going to happen here and there's quite a lot of things in there as well that you know, is a lot of people will have no idea, you know, that's not just people who don't know me, but I think that will be family members, that will be friends who don't really understand the full impact of what certain situations, um, how they affected me, how they affected my family, how they affected my friends, you know, my personal life. Um, and especially with the mental health stuff, like I was very um, proud of how open and honest I was with that particular period yeah. um because i know that it i know that it might help someone deal with something or it might help them come out and make them understand that you know what i'm actually yeah. not feeling good and if i can come and do that on a you know a universal stage like uh, this documentary is gonna gonna put it to then that's huge for me knowing that you know them watching this and seeing that particular bit might actually help them and, and make them realize that um it's not weak it's not a sign of weakness to to show that you know you are feeling a bit shit sometimes yeah i thought the scenes with your dad in new zealand were kind of the most intimate and, and moving of the film did it feel strange having cameras around for what would normally be such private moments and and have you had a chance to watch that bit back yeah, honestly like no it didn't like no. because what the whisper guys were amazing at doing is making every is me, not making it feel like a scripted scene because they just they were just there but you they were they were just so in the background and you forgot that they were around um a great example is when they came out to film in the west indies for that tour is that you know we obviously had to address the group saying like you know, this documentary is happening. There's going to be a film crew around following Ben. You know, you might see them in and around, but, you know, they're going to try and not get in the way. And they were very conscious of that. That They they might do that. They might interfere or get in the way. And then when they'd finished filming and I'd sort of, you know, said thanks to the lads for just sort of cracking on, they were like, oh, how long were they here for? Like, I thought they were here for like three days. So, like, that, that's how good they were at staying away and making every filming bit that they were doing just like not set up and they're just there like in the background like you just forgot they were there and I think that comes across really well in the doc that it's just yeah you just see me as me and um, at one point you say in the film that you used to fear failure but now you embrace it uh, I wondered was there a particular moment where that changed for you and has that change the perspective influenced the first few months of your captaincy what we've seen over the last few months mm, no I've, just for, for a while now like because you know, I, I look at it going if if I didn't have nerves if I didn't worry about me personally failing then I don't I think that shows that I don't care you know like if I don't have nerves about a situation I'm like oh well I'm not that bothered how it goes if I don't have fear of failing because if I don't do well then you know the team's gonna I don't know someone else needs to like do well for us to do well um so if I don't have those feelings towards cricket and my sport and my job then I sort of look at it as well I don't really care so rather than like letting all those emotions of fear and failure eat me up and swallow me I just embrace it and go you know what I'm glad I feel like this because it shows I really care <laughs> Mm -hmm. Stuart Broad says at one point um, 
that he genuinely thought you might never play again when you took your break from the game and he was catching up with you, but he said he wasn't talking about cricket, he was just talking about kind of life in general. Do you think that was ever a realistic possibility that you could have just said thanks very much and, and walked away from it all? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, and when you say that, I, one of the, bit, the standout things for me watching the back for the first time, the, the documentary, was actually hearing one of my friends say what I was thinking without me actually saying that to anybody. I never mentioned it to anybody outside of my my circle. But the fact that I was giving off those vibes to, to someone without telling them, that to me was like, Jesus Christ, that was like bad there. Like, yeah. Like I, I, at some stage I was happy. Like I was just like, I might not play again here. I like, would just see how we go. Like, but then to see Brody come out and like really seriously say, like I could see him not playing again. For me, that was like a, oh shit. Like really powerful scene for me, that one. Yeah. You, you said you were really keen for it to be authentic, but you know, you, you were going through a tough time at that point. Was there any part of you that just wanted to be left alone and, and to deal with this stuff in your own time? Or do you think actually having there's a bit some of the stuff with Sam Mendes almost comes across as like a therapy session in <laughs> itself. I wondered if it if it kind of possibly helped in a way too. Uh look, talking helps with that kind of stuff, but like yeah, there was times where I was just like, you know, just with certain things, but I guess it's so hard to actually explain to someone how you feel at a time like that. But I guess great way to explain it is that at the time I felt a real responsibility to make sure that I get on camera and speak about this and just finally there's a really nice moment with uh Joe Root when he says that not many people get to see the best side of you but he's very grateful that he does uh, I haven't know you haven't seen the final product but do you think this this film will will help in that regard and people will see if not necessarily the best side of you a more authentic version than, than we might have perhaps pieced together from from yeah. the press well, i hope so because that was the aim of it is to to come across as me and no one else but me away from what people might already have a opinion of what i'm like you know but that opinion's probably only formed from what they see of me when i play cricket or or anything like that and um, obviously my friends and my family and people who are close to me know what i'm like but you know there's quite a lot of people around the world who know who i am but don't know me for what I am, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but look, you know, some people will watch it and may might think, oh, he's 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 a legend. But some people might watch it and think, oh, he's an absolute prick. But that's for their opinion, and yeah, they're allowed to think like that. <laughs> the Cricket Supporters Association has launched its biggest survey yet, and is looking to find out what cricket fans think about a wide range of issues and topics surrounding the game. With questions relevant to players and non-players and including questions on scheduling, cricket formats and engagement, county membership, diversity and inclusion. The survey also includes questions relevant to the current ECB high performance review to give supporters the opportunity to have their views heard. The way this will work is that all insight and statistics gathered from fans who take the survey will be analysed anonymously by the CSA and presented to the ECB to enable fans' views to be considered in relation to the review. The ECB will then continue to work with the CSA as the review continues to obtain any further supporter insight. The survey also asks about discriminatory behaviour and what has or hasn't been seen or heard at cricket by fans of the game and any related impact this has had. This will assist in the current work being undertaken within the game to tackle racism and promote inclusion and diversity. To take part, all you have to do is head to cricketsupporters.com forward slash survey. Uh, I mean, we talk about a lot of the things that the survey covers. So if you get this far into most of our episodes, I strongly, strongly recommend you get involved and head to that link that we'll leave in the description for this episode. Yeah, here, here. Never a more important time. Joe, what's your moment of the week? Uh, my moment of the week was uh, last night, um, Sunday night, the 100, the Northern Superchargers versus Manchester Originals. Uh, have they got a name for that derby yet? I won't call um, it a Roses Clap. <laughs> you're my definitely head not allowed to do that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, absolute run fest. So the women's game was um, a record chase from the Northern Superchargers. Laura Volfart scoring uh, 90 not out to see them home. Uh, Did she open? Yeah. Finally. Chasing. Four or five all, all that, that was such a good game. DeAndre Dawson was hitting it so far. Right. She, she was uh, Manchester. She was hitting the ball so far. I think she hit 68 off 30 or something. I think 44 of her last 10 balls. Which yeah. Really <laughs> absolutely absurd. Yeah. Bloody hell. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a really good deck for, for, for short form cricket. And then that continued into the men's game. 
Manchester originals made 208 for five, the highest ever score in, in the 100, men's 100. Uh, 16 sixes in there, which is another record, uh, and eventually won by 23 runs. But actually, it looked like for a good deal of supercharged chase, it looked like there was a good good game on then. But it was the match hero, as they call him now, that I wanted to focus on. Phil Salt uh, hit 55 from 25 as an opener, uh, including three consecutive sixes off Adil Rashid. Uh, really piling the pressure on Jason Roy now, who's still struggling. Got a few the other day, but it was it looked like hard work. So only Milan scored more runs than Salt in the competition this year. You know, Salt's played four T20s for England, but he's batted six, seven, and four. He's so clearly at his best opening up, going hard in the power play. It's it's only a matter of time before England have a look at him. We've obviously seen what he can do in the 50-over stuff when he got his chance in the sort of replacement squad last summer and then against the, the Dutch on that mini tour there as well. Uh, also, Whisper It, been keeping in the four-day stuff for Lancashire. Hmm. Throwing back to our earlier yeah. conversation. Mm. We don't know how he is against 94 mile an hour fast bowling, do we? <laughs> no, we do not. No, we do um, not. But stranger things have happened. W- one of the things I, I kind of had against Salt being, uh, I guess, the next man in for England white ball cricket is that he's got a fairly poor record in T20 competitions outside of the blast, yeah. including the 100. So I think for him to have a really good 100, just as his name is is being mentioned more in those selection meetings, I think that the timing of that is... is well is, timed. Yeah, Certainly. especially with the World Cup. Because I spoke to him last summer just before the 100 and had a brilliant blast and it felt, and he'd just played for England in the one day as, and it felt that was kind of his time that had a poor tournament actually. And you know, the way he plays, he is going to be a a streaky player to some extent. Um, But there's certainly plenty to excite England fans there. Mm. Um, Yeah, I I think he'll be in the squad. It's just whether he gets the nod to open or not. And just a word on the originals as well, who are my tips to win it. Lost their first three, uh, have won their next three. So they're still in the hunt for the mm. top three. I think if they can win their final two group games, they've got a decent chance. And if they do that, then no one's going to want to play them in the in the knockout stage. They've, they've still got a very good side. I'm not quite sure how they lost their first three games, to be honest. I think it was their, their bowlers kind of let them down a bit. Josh Butler has got a calf strain, I think it is. Andre Russell has gone home now. That's mm. That was his last game. But they've got plenty of options. Tristan Stubbs is seeing them well. Oh, what a play. Yeah, I was going to mention that him, actually. Talking about South African cricket and the talent available. He is a serious player with a, with a good first-class record as well. Hasn't played many games, but uh, there's a kind of simplicity to his game, which you think maybe he could just do it. he'd do the lot if South Africa is still playing test cricket in five years' time. Yeah, I really enjoyed that game as well. Um, I know Rashid got hit for three sixes in his opening set of five, but then he would bowl, he would bowl brilliantly to the set Russell and, and Stubbs later on. I think he bowled 10 balls in a row and Russell basically decided, I'm not going to hit you. And then the last ball of Rashid's spell, Russell does go for the big shot and gets caught on the boundary. Um, how, how have you guys found watching the, the men's 100 in particular this this summer? I I probably enjoy watching 100 games more than England bilateral games. I think there's more going on there, the, the overseas element, having having elite overseas players alongside England English players who haven't had opportunity to play against these kind of established names before. I think great to watch. Maybe that's a novelty factor that will wear off a few years in when you kind of know how these players will do against the, the elite, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. All right. Uh, I, I can't really compare it to are you talking about 20 T20 eyes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not, I'm not, mean, not comparing uh, it to test matches. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll watch one if I have to of a T20 yeah. eye. Um, so that's my position on those, really. Outside, enjoy a World uh, Cup, uh, No, no, sorry. Outside of a, of a world tournament where obviously the, the narrative is, is different. Um, I haven't seen a, a massive amount of it, but I have to say what I have seen, I've, I've, I've relatively enjoyed. I've watched it with open eyes, without getting waylaid by agendas if I can help it and what I find is that I, the atmosphere either either the tv cameras are very cleverly editing the sound quality and cutting out certain barren areas of the ground which obviously is a time-honored tactic or it's a genuine reflection of the enthusiasm within within the grounds but the vast majority of games I've seen if you take out the first one which was a bit of a dead game I think maybe at Cardiff can't remember but anyway that was a tricky bad game on on night one but after that day two was at the oval and since then the games that i've seen the atmosphere has been genuinely good and there does appear to be a connection for, with, the, with the fans inside the ground at least with their home team and with the competition itself and that for me is just about enough at this point at this point 
I think when we sat around what two years ago, three years ago, talking about the the positives and negatives of this thing, I think one of the things certainly I thought are and this is part of the kind of wider narrative are people going to feel connected to these teams is that a problem is, is no one going to care about them in the way they care about the counties i don't see that actually i think from what i've seen on tv and what i've seen here at the oval i think the fans are connected and actually just taking the oval as, a, as an example i think the home fans are more invested in the oval invincibles than they are surrey a lot of the time if you take it compared to a blast night blast night on a friday which is you know a, a lot of generally a lot of young men coming for a bit of a piss up the audience is a bit different for the hundreds i think the kids genuinely care who wins they go and support their team they buy some merch and you notice it when the opposition hit a six there's almost a kind of silence in a way that you'd expect i don't know like at the ipl um which isn't the case at the blast the blast everyone cheers everything uh, and that's <laughs> that's good too i'm not saying one is better or worse than the other but that idea that Play, that fans new fans wouldn't feel any affiliation to these teams um i don't think has been borne out i think that is one thing that has has been a a, a reasonably strong success mm. yeah I'd, I'd say that the, the tactical stuff has actually made probably slightly more of a difference than i thought it would as well and it, and it increasingly so almost like a, you find yourself like it gets to like the last set of 10 uh and there's a set better in with a number eight and the set batter takes a single, you're like, oh, well, like, like that, that actually can feel like it takes a lot more away from a team if they get stuck on strike for that amount of time. Yeah, I, I agree with that, actually. I can't even remember what the game was, but there was a few nights ago, and that's telling in itself, I can't remember which one it was, or even which bloody bowler it was, but there was a particular bowler, spinner, and, and he, he was controlling the game, and so he ended up bowling 20 deliveries across 25 Option, you know, 25 available deliveries of which this this bowler bowled 20. It's shocking. You have to edit this out. I can't even remember who it was. But the point does stand, right? That, that there is a bit more flexibility and a bit more nuance in there than, than I, I expect it to be as well. Yeah, I, I really like... Um, you, you, you get it quite often. The, the, the batters not being able to get on the strike at all and that taking away their momentum is, is quite a big part of it. And I don't think batters have really worked out how to get around it. So here... <laughs> Imran Tahir. <laughs> uh, the one thing I'd say about this tournament, though, is there has been a bit of a lack of close games. I mean, I think you have to go back to uh, almost the 13, 12 match competition to find the last real close game in the men's competition. I mean, that that's mitigated quite a lot, actually, by the by the women's game starting. I think the, the first week of the men's tournament felt like it dragged because if you have, I said this last week or two weeks ago, but if you have one game a day, and it's any of them you get a couple of not good games in a row then actually you've got quite a lot of time and especially when that's almost the only visible cricket on you've got quite a lot of time without anything really that notable happening almost mm. whereas now with the women's games on you're that much more likely to get a close game each day uh, and it, it, it does just really emphasize how actually obviously the the men's tournament has obviously been needed for the women's to uh, uh to give it that sort of that platform but also the 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 men's tournament wouldn't be aimed at when they're as good as well without the women's as well, I think. Mm. In, in the women's competition, Birmingham, Birmingham Phoenix and Southern Brave are top at the time of recording. Uh, Bryony Smith, who's played a bit for England, but not much, is having an excellent tournament with both bat and ball. Um, my moment of the week is watching Mitchell Stanley bowl for the first time. Uh, I saw that he bowled 92 miles per hour and kind of didn't believe it. Um, he, as what, we discussed... what was your first thought, Joe, when you heard him? <laughs> I thought he was an Australian who'd done really well in the Big Bash that yeah. I probably should have heard of. Yeah. Uh, and it was Me, really nice. exactly the same. Very nice to hear he came, he's from Shropshire <laughs> yeah. uh, and bowls really fast. Uh, kind of pl- pluck from the blast. Um, he, he had Joss Butler dropped at slip in one of his first, if not his first, blast game earlier this season. Uh, and he bowled... It was very expensive yesterday, that, that must be said. But um, his first ball to Faf Duplessis genuinely rushed... Duplessis and he re- reminds me quite a lot of Umran Malik in his first season of the IPL he's not as quick as Umran Malik he's not, he's not far off granted um, in that he's got the pace doesn't quite know how to use it at the moment but you kind of sense that from how good his good balls are once he does he's going to be a real real handful yeah and it's worth saying quite how unknown he was like he played six times for Worcestershire before the 100 this year so he, I think he would have been the most unknown player in the competition I reckon just about yeah, possibly. Um, and uh, and that and he was certainly uh, given none of us knew who he was. Yeah, so. <laughs> and and he really made uh, in that first. I mean, he was expensive yesterday, but actually, he was a big reason why Manchester Originals won on his debut. I think in his second set of five, uh, it was a wicket maiden, if you're allowed to use the term uh, maiden these days. You might not edit it out, but uh, uh, 
uh, Stanley Mitchell, not Mitchell Stanley, is uh, from the Eminem song Stan, and that's the origin of the uh, the internet word Stan or Stans, which is from Stan culture. So that's that's what I first thought when I heard him. I was like, I've heard that name before, and that's what it was. Blimey. Um, uh, yeah, look, Worcestershire produced him. You know, at the risk of this sounding like you know a kind of hundred hundred show, and I know how that's going to go down. Your Worcestershire produced him. He's 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 come through the ranks there, but again, a low profile. You know, didn't play in England under 19s or anything like that. But Worcestershire produced him. He's been effectively loaned away for three weeks of his county county summer. He'll be back for Worcestershire for the final stretch of the summer. Hopefully, they'll throw a four-day game or two at him, and it'll be great to see how he goes from there on in. But it's worth remembering, we may have seen him first in a 100 kit, but that's not where he began, and that's probably not where he'll finish either. You know, and so... I think it's probably worth mentioning that. And fair play to Worcester as well, who are bringing through some good young kids in very tricky circumstances because they don't have a massive budget, as we know. Um, so, yeah, fair play to them. Feather in their cap. Um, I have a gripe about the 100, which is probably helpful at this point to balance things up. <laughs> but I genuinely thought this the other day. So um, if players aren't required for their 100 sides, yeah. they're not allowed to be released to their county. Yeah, I and, that. And that, that has to change. So Jack Leaning was one example who's not been able to play for Kent in the one-day cup. You know give the county fans a, a, a something here it's because you know if the same situation was England and the county they they get released all the time mm. I, and I don't see I don't see a difference there I think Paul Farbrace is making that point particularly with young players so uh, Warwickshire have Jacob Bethel and Dan Mousley with 100 franchises but they're not playing um, that's just that's and, bonkers. and they're they're currently not getting the opportunity to play in uh, in the Royal London when at eighteen and twenty one respectively. You think that'd be a massively valuable experience for both? Yeah, for so many reasons for their development, but also those are the players that Warwickshire fans will want to go and see when they want to, when they go and watch the One Day Cup. So it's that that needs to be fixed. Yeah, it also drives a wedge between the two tournaments. It suggests that there are fewer connections binding them, and there, if anything, there are there are wedges driven between them, and that's obviously not healthy going forward not only for the individuals, but for the, the overall impression of the thing. Mm. Uh, and just on the success of the women's competition this year, already in the competition, every venue that has hosted a women's game has recorded personal best attendances this year compared to anything they had last year. Um, moving on, James Hildreth has retired from the professional game with immediate effect. An injury has ruled him out from the rest of the season. Uh, so he retires having played over 700 matches across all formats for Somerset. 27,000 runs, 5,400. He is Somerset's third highest run scorer in first class cricket, averaging over 40 in the format. Um, widely regarded as one of the best players never to have played for England uh, and a genuine Somerset legend. Um and also this week, it was announced that Darren Stevens will not be at Kent next season, but he has also not announced his retirement. So at 46, he's still not done yet. Um, he leaves Kent after 17 years at the county. And Venue said that he's put his name forward for the Big Bash this winter. Yeah, as has basically everyone in the English game. I think I saw your name on there, as actually. So <laughs> if you get a call from uh, the Sydney Sixers, that'll be why. But yeah, he, uh, he is going for it, which is good to see, I suppose. Mm. Um, he'll, he'll be back at Leicester next year. Put your mortgage on it. Is that, is that the inside scoop with no, Joe Walker? No, just, just, just my half Well, I stabbed in the dark, but I thought exactly the same. So. <laughs> <laughs> ben, what was your moment of the week? <laughs> uh, well, it, it could only be Derbyshire's point deduction in the uh, the Royal London One Day Cup for, I mean, we thought the Leicester one a few weeks ago was a, a bit uh, a bit ridiculous. This this goes way beyond that. So after they had just lost a game against Yorkshire, it's clearly it hadn't made a difference. Um, there was someone there whose job it is, I didn't know this job existed, was to, uh, to make sure all their kit was in order and uh, according to regulations. And one of Derbyshire's players had a bat that was within regulations, but he had put some tape around it to keep it together. And the tape meant that the bat was slightly too thick, which meant that they got two points deducted from them in the Royal London One Day Cup. Sorry, they got a point deduction because one guy's bat was a couple of milligrams too heavy? Yes, uh, I think I think too thick, mil millimetres too, too thick. Okay, too wow, wide. wow. Um, now, it wouldn't have made any difference to Derbyshire's chances of qualifying, uh, but that is still mind-blowing, isn't it? The, the game cricket, yes, cricket never fails to surpass itself. Derbyshire's game with Yorkshire yesterday was amazing, by the way. It was 109 played, um, 109. 10 I think yeah Yorkshire won by one wicket on a on a spicy wicket 
um, at Chesterfield. At Chesterfield. Yeah, 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 Queen's Park. Apparently yeah. it was a, a shocker. If you go through the stream, there are some, some, quite, quite a few balls either shooting quite low or, or really popping up. I think up. four players were hit by mm. balls that have just spat from nowhere. Mm. Um, Sam Connors, who recently played for England Lions, took a five for there for Derbyshire. Um, the Group A is extremely close. There are four teams currently joint top with uh, 10 points. Gloucester have played one more game than everyone else in that group. Uh, Sussex, Middlesex and Leicestershire, the other teams on 10 points. And in the in Group B, Hampshire and Lancashire. Hampshire and Lancashire are top with 12 and 11 points, respectively. Uh, one of the standout... Hampshire's out- still on for the treble. Mm, yeah. <laughs> this is the last week's show, Joe. We did all that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cut that then. The, one of the performances around was uh, Sussex youngster Ali Orr scoring a double hundred. He's only 21, uh, but he's building a very good record in both red ball and white ball cricket at the moment. Someone we've talked about a little bit on the show before this, this summer. Um, and Phil, you uh, want to talk a little bit about how Actually, there are people going to these games. People, it's not might not be on television, but um, county members are still properly getting behind the Royal on the One Day Cup. Yeah, we we can't pretend that it's been foregrounded as it should be. Uh, we'd be kidding ourselves. But the streams are still available, and if you if you love your county and if you're interested in how they're getting on, then they these games are still available, more widely available than they have been in previous years. They're just not on Sky. Uh, commentaries are still available as well uh i can only speak from my own experience and and i've been i've watched two essex games um and followed the rest relatively closely but i've watched two myself and they were were both at chelmsford and they were both very well attended games with good atmospheres you get that anyway at chelmsford it's a small compact ground but it's been a they've been clearly well attended and well followed games and from a Spectator, from a fan's point of view, I've been able to watch the emergence uh, and been able to develop my own judgments on a handful of players that I've heard about coming up through the ranks and who've been recommended to me by various people at the club. But now I can see them with my own eyes. Uh, and there are some interesting stories from left field. And funnily enough, the bloke that I mentioned on our podcast a few weeks ago, who I happened to play against on the Saturday afternoon, and he smashed us for 130. Well, he's now averaging 60 plus, batting four for Essex in the 50 over stuff he may yet develop and become a, a very good county cricketer he's the, the south african bloke with a good first class record in south africa but we've all, i've also seen a couple of other open, openers who've come in robin das is a is the bangladeshi asian lad who's come through the setup the first person to to represent essex from that particular uh, background i've seen him play i've seen josh ryan will play these these names who i've known about but never really seen i've now been able to see them and they've been they've been positive events. That's all I can say. They've been positive events, well covered, well well competed. Essex have won a few, lost a few. They're not going to qualify. I think they'll, they're in fourth. I think at the moment. Be that as it may, it served a positive a purpose for people who love the county game. Um, in and of itself, it could be more. It should be more. The discrepancies, as Joe just highlighted, we don't want there to be this dramatic gap between one and the other. We want it to be servicing one at one and another we want the system the fabric to be to be tighter than it is sure we would love a game or two to be on proper television for sure uh but all that said i'm i would struggle to be cynical about the stuff that i've seen albeit i've only seen my own team but i would struggle to be cynical about any of it yeah and, and similarly in somerset always get Good fans, but they had got a remarkable crowd down last weekend when they were already out. They've been hopeless, to be fair. They've lost seven from seven, but to get, I think, a, a few thousand down at the ground was a, a really good effort. And just to echo, the, I think the bit of cricket, apart from the Test match, I've been most invested in across the last month or so was probably that Ben Green innings for Somerset when he hit 157. I think they needed about 130 when he came in, or not when he came in, but when they were, when they lost their eighth wicket and he got them to within nine runs I think before falling the last over it was an incredible innings and that was uh, I mean the, the, the closeness of the cricket has often been very good uh, and as, as Phil said the standard is uh, while it's, it's a different sort of standard I suppose to county cricket normally doesn't mean it's worse in a lot of ways because you just get uh, different stories emerging all that sort of thing. Mm. In the international game the Asia Cup starts later this week India and Pakistan will be without Jasprit Bumrah and Shaheen Afridi respectively which is 
It's obviously a shame for any cricket tournament. It might, though, give an opportunity for Nassim Shah to make his T20i debut. He took a five for yesterday as Pakistan beat Netherlands by nine runs in a very good, close ODI at Rotterdam. Um, possible blow for Pakistan's World Cup chances. Shaheen should be back in time for the tournament, but um, will have had very, very little cricket before it. He's already been ruled out of the seven-match T20 series that they're playing England before the World Cup. Yeah, and... We obviously know he's he's massively important as we saw in the in the tournament last year when uh, yeah he, he was obviously absolutely sensational in that game against against India uh, and yeah he's one of the best and most exciting bowlers to watch in the world in that format and I think it also shows I think they've brought in Mohammad Hasnain as mm. his replacement which obviously is an interesting story there but you know he's he's nowhere near it's quite a drop off isn't it exactly mm. yeah so yeah and, and it was interesting seeing uh, on sort of Pakistani cricket Twitter in the aftermath of Sheen being ruled out, sort of every sort of possible fast bowler from the last sort of 10 years in Pakistan cricket being discussed, like could, could Wahab Riaz make a comeback? Mohamir was saying like, why is my name trending? All this sort of thing, uh, which kind of shows that there isn't a, uh, well, that there's just isn't a like, like, like Shaheen in the World Game at the moment. Yeah, I mean, Mohamed Wasim's played quite a lot and he didn't play in the World Cup last year. So he'd probably the most likely to come into the eleven. Uh, unless Nassim does really well if he gets a go in the Asia Cup. Um, but that would be a, a, a good story to follow in the next few weeks. Um, India warming up for the Asia Cup by beating Zimbabwe in an ODI series, um, which I'm not entirely sure why is happening. Um, and uh, New Zealand beat West Indies 2-1 in an ODI series as part of the ODI World Cup Super League. Ben, that's, that's a, that is a blow for West Indies World Cup qualification chances. Yeah, especially because they, I mean... They're... They've obviously won one game in there. The other two games, they pushed New Zealand uh, fairly close. So, yeah, and, and that World Cup Super League, is, it's kind of like no team wants to win that seventh or eighth spot, which I suppose is why it's the seventh or eighth spot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it'd be one to follow over the few next years. The, the scorecard from the third ODI, West Indies scorecard, was uh, was amazing. It was basically exactly what you'd expect West Indies ODI back in scorecard to look like. You had Shy Hope make 51 off 100 which obviously what he does. Carmez, to be fair to him, made a very good runnable 100 and then Varane hit 90 of about 50 balls and then there were like six single-figure scores uh, and then like someone hit a quick 20 to get them just over 300. It's just uh, exactly what West Indies are <laughs> like in ODI cricket and was uh, comforting to see if nothing else. Mm. Um, Phil, yeah. what's your moment of the week? Oh, My moment of the week occurred on Saturday evening uh, in a place called Harlow in Essex. And we, my team, were chasing 260 in 45 overs on a good track with a fast outfield. And uh, we needed something like 70-odd, 80-odd. When I came out to bat and I started going all right and another lad who's, you know, 20 years younger than me and much more energetic and in form and actually plays every week and concentrates and practices. He came out and started smashing it. And we have to win this game, right? We have to win this game because we're down, we're down near the bottom and it's a proper dogfight. And if we'd won this game, we'd have gone through. We'd, we'd have been safe with two more games to go. And our lad got out, caught long off. And then we, we needed something like 30 from the last four. So 30 from 24 balls and we are six or seven down. And... I hit a nice shot that went for four and then another nice shot that went for two. And then I hit a shot as clean as I possibly can against their opening bowler who'd come back and I tried to open the face and hit it over extra cover into that gap. And I hit it as clean and as sweet as I possibly could. And this fella, who's probably 45, 50, bit of a silver fox, ran round. 25, 30 yards around the boundary. And apparently the ball was going for six. Uh, and he kind of dived and managed to catch it in his chest. Uh, and I was out. And it was a, a yard apparent because we had two lads who were actually yeah. out there at the time walking around the boundary. Apparently, like, you know, half a yard shy of the boundary would have gone for six. Certainly one bounce four. And then we went bang, bang, bang. And we lost the game by 11 runs. And I, I, I felt empty and devastated and embarrassed and we all should have done it and none of us stood up and all of that right uh 
I woke up Sunday morning, first thing I thought. Woke up this morning, first thing I thought. First thing. And this is interesting to me because I am wrestling with myself as a, as a recreational cricketer. I've been doing it for many, many, many years. The old grade cricketer line, you know, can I do one more circuit? You know, I'm, I've got myself married. I've got a house. I've got a life-ish. Do I really want to be going back to this thing? I've only played a handful of games this year due to various reasons. Uh, but the pain was so exquisite. The, the, the disappointment was so sublimely awful that it stayed with me for, for, for 48 hours and I can't wrestle it out of me, which probably tells me in the end that I am stuck with this fucking thing. I am here forever. I think this is heartening stuff. Phil. And I can't I shake it. I can't shake it. I thought I was out. And it draws me back in. And there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing. I can't shake this, this nonsense. Uh, I would love to be sort of, sort of loftily ambivalent about the whole thing. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll play next week. Maybe I won't. doesn't matter. No, no. Uh, it's, it's in me. It's, it's in these kind of dark veins of, of, of myself. And, and I can't extract it, even though I'd like to. Bottom line... We've got to win next week in the classic six-point relegation game. And if we don't, then we're probably going down. So my club had a relegation six-pointer this week. I think if we lost that, we'd probably go down. We won it by 35 runs, which means we're probably safe. And that was just such a sweet feeling at the end of the game. Just... What, what are your figures, Yaz? Oh, thanks for asking. Uh, 7.2 2 overs, five maidens, two for nine. That was that was really good fun. Um, I knew the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd want to tell them. So apparently, no, I did. Apparently, I did. he's got his outswinger back. Yeah, just just it's it's not 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 um, down the hatches. He's yeah, out. They sorted out those dodgy jukes. Is that the? Well, it could, could well be that. It's not a it's not a particularly obvious outswinger, but my stock ball has just been moving in by quite a lot for a while, and now it's I can actually control one to just about move away, and I think having both balls has made quite a big difference this season. Um, but yeah, just that, that feeling of winning, almost the opposite of you. The first thing I thought on Sunday morning is like, oh, that was a good win. Um, so yeah, long live the club game. Um, no, no, no. To hell with the club game. <laughs> um, long live it. Just before we finish, as we're going to end there, but just a, a slight um, change to what we're saying about the 100. Literally four minutes ago, Manchester Originals announced that Josh Butler will not take any further part in the 100 due to the calf injury he picked up last Thursday. Laurie Evans will now captain the side for the remainder of the competition, so we might want to alter our predictions for the, for the rest of the tournament with Butler out and Russell gone. Uh, yeah. Good joke. It's good to have an excuse why your prediction hasn't worked. Uh, <laughs> well, I think it could still work. That's true. Still That's true. Side. I'm, I'm sticking to my guns. It's win-win. They won last night without him. Yeah, it's, it's win-win. Well, they did have Russell. I think, I think I said at the start of the competition that I think they'd win because they had Butler, Russell and Hasaranga, none of whom are left. Um, anyway, that's all we have time for today's show. Cheers, Ben. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Joe. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week.